Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson today. For the hour, we're going to interview our head Springer Spaniel here, our head grouse dog, Brookie, who will be sitting in. No, actually, Brookie's in the studio and jumped on my lap right before we began this, um, and she's going to make an exit now. We're actually going to speak to one of the pivotal figures in American journalism and broadcasting you may not be familiar with. His name is Chris Pavlovsky, and he's the CEO of Rumble, which is the answer to the question many of us have been asking for the past three or four years, which is, how do you continue democracy without freedom of speech? Well, you build your own protected platform. And not only has Chris Pavlovsky done that in Rumble, but he succeeded on a deeper level than we knew. He joins us for the hour right now. Chris Pavlovsky, great to see you. Tucker, thanks for having me. So be um, before you get into what Rumble is, Congratulations, by the way. Rumble just went public. I should, I should start at the end uh, and say that the market has affirmed your decision to build this, this new platform um, in a huge way. So that's really affirming to those of us who want this to work. Um, but tell us who you are and how, how old you are. How did you get here? Like, how did how does this happen? Yeah, I know the story is that, you know, I've been at a high school. I was uh, building websites. Where'd uh, you grow up? In... Brampton, Ontario, Brampton, Canada. Canada. Okay. Yeah, so it was in Canada. And, uh, you know, grade 11, grade 12, I was building websites at a, my parents' basement. The the typical story out of the parents' basement. <laughs> no, it's, yeah. not, it's not what I did in high school. <laughs> well, for the internet entrepreneur, I guess. Um, in, what were you building in your parents' basement? Anything dangerous? Just, just websites, you know? Just websites. Yeah, my parents thought I was selling drugs at the time. Because <laughs> like, we started making money, and then all of a sudden, where is this money coming from? What kind from? of websites were you building? Just viral video websites. So, like, cute cats and dogs, uh, things that go viral on the internet. And uh, it was, like, it was grade 11, grade 12. And then by 2001, I uh, started making some money. And I remember, How old were you? I was in, like second year or first year of university at the time. And you're actually making a profit. Yeah, no, I actually, the, the story is, is that the, the first month in business, well, that when we launched it, we made $5,000 in a single month. And the second month we made 10. And then they ended up sending us duplicate checks and both cashed. <laughs> and next thing you know, I'm like, holy shit, I don't even need university anymore. <laughs> so that, that's how it started. It was Wait, like- Were you continuing? I mean, no, as soon as I, as soon as I made that money, I went to university and I was just like studying and then, you know, I kind of stopped and took a break from it because it just, it was a lot of money. I thought I didn't need any more money for the rest of my Did life. Did you ever go back time. to college? Uh, no, I didn't. Good for you. Yeah. Good so, you. so that, that decision paid off. It sure did. It sure did. So by, you know, 2005, I get like 2003, I get really back into it again. Um, realizing that, you know, $15,000 is not last a lifetime. Yeah. And then, uh, <laughs> what did you do with the 15 grand? I, you know, I think I spent it going out to bars and stuff when, yeah. during university, just like stupid stuff. Uh, but it, it went like in a couple of years pretty quickly. Um, got a car as well. So it was, uh, it was good. It was, it was a good time. So by 2003, we got back into it, and I remember one of my my best friends had like a top 50 website, and he was at a like we met in high school, and this is now post university. He's like, he's like, I can I can no longer like compete in this space in in video because it's too expensive. Uh, my friend told me he's like, but check these guys out; they're going to dominate the video space. And that site in 2005 that he sent me was YouTube. And I'm like, there's no way they're going to beat you. He's like, they are. They got you know, unlimited money and funding, they can now support, you know, building a free hosting video site. And I'm like, okay. Two years later, by 2000, late 2006, Google comes in, buys YouTube, and, uh, you know, the rest is uh, history. They integrate them into their search engine, they end up dominating video, and they basically monopolize the entire the video space uh, using with their help using Google. So that happened in 2007, 2008. You kind of remember all those websites like Ebombs World, Call yes, of Humor. That, those were my World. days. That was where I came from, building sites like that. What was your site called? Jokeroo. Jokeroo. Yeah. And uh, by 2000, you know, by 2008, 2009, it was, you know, the end of, of, of that time for us because now YouTube kind of sucked up all the oxygen in the room, became like the de facto video platform. You saw the break.coms, the e-bombs worlds, the college humors all kind of like, you know, no longer become those huge properties that they were. And, 
it wasn't until 2010 that I started to notice that there was like an opportunity emerging again in video. And this time it was different. It was like, you started to notice that like, not just YouTube, but all the big social media platforms started to preference. They started and really kind of prioritize like larger creators, influencers, in particular, multi-channel networks, which is like, uh, you know, an MCN. And what that means is just companies aggregating a bunch of content creators so that they can monetize them better. Um, and corporations and big brands. So they started prioritizing these. So by 2010, I thought like, you know, there might be an opportunity to really help the small guy, the small creator. And by 2013, that's what we did. We launched Rumble in late 2013 to really uh, get in there and help that small creator um, ha you know, get the same tools that those large creators were getting on the incumbent platforms. So like, you know, same monetization tools, same uh, distribution tools, uh, even more distribution tools. So we built Rumble on the premise of helping that small creator in 2013. Um, so you know. did you have a thought that maybe Google would buy you as it did YouTube? That was never a thought. It was always the, the bigger thought in my head was always, I want to, I want to get back and kick their ass and, and beat them. Uh, so you were anti-monopoly from the beginning. Uh, always, always. I, I, I felt like the way they use their Google search to, you know, get a huge foot in the ground for YouTube and really take over. Google Video shut down, Meta Cafe shut down, Daily Motion kind of like no longer went, uh, was no longer uh, feasible once they, once they bought them. I felt like no site could get search traffic on video anymore. So I was like, that, that was a chip on my shoulder to run it, really kind of get back and, and dominate that space. Did you ever have contact with the, with the YouTube people, the Google people? In the sense that like we worked with them as a business because we had no choice yes of course every every video company had but to. did you ever sit down with anyone in a position of authority at those companies and no talk? never never. never no to this day authority well what's authority like i don't know some someone you know not someone that, levels, an executive right? yeah well you know maybe canadian uh, but not really no i wouldn't say anything anybody of authority interesting yeah it's, uh, Since you now have a real company that is competing with them, that's interesting. Yeah, now it's uh, now it's a whole different story. But yeah, yeah. Um, we so yeah, 2013 we launched helping the small creator, and uh, you know our politics at the time were cute cats and dogs. It wasn't yeah. you know we didn't have politics on our site. I think like one of our first political oriented news publishers on Rumble was Reuters. Um, in 2000, I don't remember, but 2014, 15, around there. Yes. And then EW Scripts, which owns a whole bunch of local yeah. local stations. So they came on and, and they started using Rumble. So we weren't really political at all. The, the biggest videos on the platform were dog videos, uh, cat videos, viral yeah. videos, home, home-based home videos, small creator type of stuff. So that was our focus, really helping that, helping that community as much as possible, kind of get the same tools, monetization and distribution that they could no longer get on these incumbent platforms. And these incumbent platforms become became even worse and worse over time, introducing like more barriers for the small creators to monetize, more barriers for them to get access to tools. And as they did that, Rumble kind of accelerated and accelerated and you know grew and grew. Why do you suppose if you just pause why do you suppose that from the beginning or early on, YouTube gave such dramatic preference to the big over the small? Oh uh, this is you're striking at a question that, you know, Great question. I think YouTube had a really big problem with copyright when they started. So much so that most of their growth was attributed to stolen content. Yes. You saw all of their, um, you saw all those lawsuits happen with Viacom. Yeah. Etc. Uh, a lot of the growth came because creators were uploading like full SNL clip. Full <laughs> For S sure. And, yeah, absolutely. And, and they grew on the backs, in my opinion, they grew on the backs of a lot of stolen content. And that's how they were able to get from like, you know, that super growth really quickly. People would search that clip, they'd find YouTube, they'd be on, it'd get I to remember YouTube. That. Yeah. And, and, and that's how they grew. You could watch whole movies on YouTube. So they, they had this huge stolen content problem. And by 2009 and 2010, you know, they started introducing tools to like mitigate against these stolen, the stolen content because they had all these incoming lawsuits. And uh, the, the way to get around that and put a, you know, 10 foot pole between them and the content and the liability 
was to create these MCNs that I call, that, that I was telling you about, so that the MCNs, network. yeah, so they could aggregate like the creators, the legitimate creators, and then monetize them and drive revenue uh, with YouTube. Whereas you know YouTube had a problem monetizing copyrighted content. I don't, they, they couldn't. So if they had someone sit in the middle, kind of aggregate the good that content, they were able to now monetize that content. So that's so my theory. YouTube is a political player. It's a huge player in elections globally. Yeah. Um, it's an instrument of, of a bunch of different Intel services, et cetera, et cetera. Was it always that? Do you remember it becoming political? No. I, it, for as long as I remember, like when YouTube started, it was, and politics were not part of that. It was pr a pretty open platform. Yes. Uh, so open that people were uploading indiscriminately stolen content. Right. That's so, what I remember. That's the YouTube I recall. When did it change, do you think? Well, there was, I, I guess there's multiple levels of changes. In 2008 to 2010, they introduced the content ID and they introduced a, a multi-channel network. So that's the, to mitigate the copyright stuff. Yes. Um, and I think that was their first kind of like leg that they had to do. That was something they had no choice. You can't, can't build a business on stealing content. Uh, the, the, sec, the political stuff, in my opinion, started to happen like post 2000. In 16, there's an argument to say it started probably like 2012, but, uh, you know, actual like measurable like changes started happening really in 2020 and in, in 2018, 2019 and 2020 is when real changes started coming. And all of a sudden these policies became bloated and bloated and bloated and they were changing their policies every what seemed to be like every couple of weeks, um, especially when COVID hit. Uh, and then the elections and then you know next thing you know you can't talk about anything on YouTube anymore that they didn't like you to, to say So they became politicized as American society became politicized and th They just when everything you else went, know, crazy, they went I, crazy I always have that question like was it never politicized ten years ago? Or I, know, I just was know, I not paying attention? Well, that's such a great I, and I don't you know, know the, I don't know the answer I mean I follow this for a living and I wasn't aware of it as a huge force in electoral politics now It very obviously is so what were you doing during all this time? So you start Rumble 2013. Yeah. So it was 2020 where everything kind of hits the fan. Yeah. Um, you know, it was, I guess, just, was that COVID in 2020? I can't even keep yeah. track anymore. Yeah, but February 2020. That's right. So it was the summer of 2020 where we, you know, I get an incoming from the House Intel Committee, a uh, ranking member of the House Intel Committee, Congressman Devin Nunes. Imagine this, like a Canadian, uh, nothing to do with politics. Don't, don't like, you know, obviously you follow it, but like you get an incoming from the House Intel Committee. You're like, holy shit, am I under investigation? Yeah. <laughs> What's going on? So I get on a call with him and he asks me the simplest question. He's like, Chris, if I bring my content to, to your platform and I search my name, am I going to be able to find it? And I'm like... Uh, yeah, thinking like there's some kind of censorship investigation going yeah. on, you know, like which there should be maybe, you know, like you shouldn't be censoring, especially yes. in America. Um, and I'm like, no, absolutely not. Like you could definitely find your content if you search your name. There's not, you won't, you'll be able to find it. Um, and then he's like, okay, we're going to put it on Rumble. And uh, we put it on Rumble. And then... Uh, what is it that you put on Rumble? Well, he puts, we didn't put it. He, uh, co the congressman put his uh, video podcast on, on Rumble. And next thing you know, like within like a couple months, he gets like a couple hundred thousand subscribers on his Rumble channel. Meanwhile, on YouTube, and he's been on there for four years and he's advertising in his congressional district, his YouTube channel for the last, you know, four years or so to subscribe to the YouTube channel. He only has 10,000 and he has to, to, to over 200,000 on Rumble in two months, two to three months. Next thing, like once say, that, at this point, yeah, most which people had, have not heard of Rumble. No one's heard of it, it which this should not have happened. You know, we're like, I had my developers looking into this as this is like real, like what's going on? Like in it's real, like these are real subscribers. And like, we're, we're all scratching our heads. You know, it, it, it was funny. I have a developer with, that became a Canadian and uh, became a Canadian. Yeah, he became a Canadian. I guess he immigrated to Canada, became a Canadian citizen. And the next thing you know, after all this happened and you realize all the censorship's happening, he had an American flag behind his desk. <laughs> it was just a funny side, side story. Um, but yeah, like he, within t be, because of this though, because he realized the censorship stuff is really real. Like the, the fact that you can call it whatever you want, censorship, shadow banning, you know, delisting you in search. The fact that the, a, 
an elected official could get, what is it, significantly more subscribers on a platform that no one's ever heard of in two months, and he can't get more than you know 12,000 in four years on YouTube, that's a problem. Well, it's bizarre. Well, it, it suggests YouTube is suppressing his channel. It's something is happening, definitely. Um, and, so, and it was happening right before the elections. So what did you conclude from watching that? It, the, I think our whole company concluded that there's something really nefarious going on when it comes to, to censorship. Like, what, what is it that's happening? How could that happen? And it, it presented an opportunity to us, obviously, where, you know, we just had to be f fair. <laughs> like, yeah. it, we could run a good business just by being fair. And, and that's what we did. And like, you know, a couple months later, uh, Dan Bongino comes and joins Rumble and then everything just explodes. What happened that. when Bongino came? The, the same thing. He had like 700,000 subscribers on YouTube. Uh, or at the time, maybe like half a million. And then now he's over 2 million on Rumble. So the same pattern happened with every conservative, when we all know with the Twitter files, like yes. he was censored on Twitter. I can only imagine what was what was the case on YouTube. And then they, <laughs> they actually banned him from YouTube eventually. But like the same thing happened with every conservative that came to our platform. This is, it was very obvious to, if you came to Rumble and you spent more time promoting your Rumble channel and creating content for Rumble, you'd have, you'd have a better yield. Why would you work on YouTube? Why would a conservative go to YouTube at this point any, anymore? They're, they, they had better, they, they had a better yield with their, with their time. It's a rigged game. Yeah. And on Rumble, it was a fair game. And that's, that's how we've been winning. Okay. So right as this is unfolding and you're realizing, wait, we're becoming something else because America's becoming something else you have this attempt at an alternative to Twitter and Donald Trump is going to join it. It's called Parler. What you watch this, to tell that, that oh. just summarize that story for us and what you thought of it. That was the craziest thing I've ever seen happen on the internet where multiple companies came down on Parler on that weekend and we're one of the fastest growing platforms at the same time Parler is, Parler being getting all the attention, us kind of flying under the radar a little bit more. And uh, you, you, I just couldn't believe what we were watching. It was, it, it was like a movie. It was like a fictional movie. The fact is that it was real. It was bizarre. Um, so you I spent your whole life on the internet. And it's your it's your job, it's your business. Okay. It, Did you think anything like that could ever happen? First, I, I the, the thing that's I where I scratch my head the most is that every single CEO supposedly for the last 20 years has been talking about the free and open internet. And they've been parading like that's the most important thing is to not regulate the internet and keep the internet free and open. And then all of a sudden in the last three, four years, everyone's parading the opposite. Let's censor it and let's have a controlled internet. And, and I just Never in my life could I ever imagine that happening. And then what they did to Parler was like a huge wake-up call. I remember I was on your show, actually. Yes. Um, the, a day after that happened, and, and John was on just prior to me, and I came on right after. We, we filed litigation against Google like a couple days after the, the January 6th events. And it was not related to the January 6th by any means. We were, we were working on that case for six months prior to that. Just ha just happened to be that 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 morning, the uh, weekend after that we were we were filing, and uh, I was just sitting there, just dumbfounded. Like I couldn't believe that you could get a hosting provider to shut down a site based on accusations. Like that you can't even. The worst part is, is that most of the mo most of the stuff they were accusing Parler uh, Parler of was happening more so on YouTube right. or or these uh, or Facebook than it was happening on Parler, and just. Watching how they treated the situation so unfairly was uh, w w was a scary. It was a scary moment. I, I was. So why do you think they did that? Like, what was that in retrospect? Two years later, what do you think that was about? I like my personal feeling. Yes. I, I think they were eliminating competition. Yes. Like I, I, I remember, like, Par Parler got in a spot where. You know they were a real threat to the ecosystem. They became very big, very quickly, and uh, they were a threat. And it was such an easy way in their minds, the, the Amazons and 
the app stores to just pull the plug and take away that threat to the ecosystem. They they have they, these companies all like respectively have a monopoly on their certain division of the internet. Like Google search, you know, YouTube is video and Twitter is microblogging, Facebook is social network. Like they all kind of have the, it, it, it's it, it's a fun party for them like when yeah. when they when they kind of strike like think about how big these companies are in comparison to like the railroads and the tobacco companies in right. the early you know, in the 1915s and 20s, etc. Exactly. The Robert um, Baron era. Yeah. So, like, it, these are the, these are even bigger, these companies. They're they're even more powerful. They have even more control than, than those companies did at the time. So, you know, I don't think they want to get let that go. And they certainly, they, they certainly abuse their power uh, with the parlor situation. No, there's no doubt about it. Like, they abuse their power. And, and if they... If they didn't, they certainly treated Parler with a different standard than than they treated YouTube and Twitter, of course, and the other and the other companies. So, whether they abuse their power or not, you know, make your own minds up on that. But they definitely didn't treat it to the same standard as the other. So companies. they essentially unplugged Parler. Yeah. You couldn't operate Parler under those conditions, correct? Yeah, they unplugged them. They they shut them off at the hosting level, and. Uh, Will you explain to people who aren't fluent in this what the hosting level means? So there's like two sides of the spectrum the way I like to look at it. One is that you got your devices where everyone accesses the internet, your phones, yep. your computers, your TVs. And then on the other side of the internet are like the, the lines and the servers where your phones have to connect to to get to. Correct. So on one side of the wagon, you have Google and Apple that control the phones. They have enormous control there. And on the other side, you have... Amazon that has AWS and a few other like Microsoft that has Azure that control the hosting. What is can the you cloud. explain what AWS is? So Amazon Web Services uh, and Microsoft Azure are, are cloud companies. They they own a lot of servers. They connect those servers to the power lines that get to your devices. So that's like a it's a warehouse filled with computers. Computers with disk space. Yeah, and you know Parler had their website on those computers. So that you consumers can can access them. So the idea was pre January twenty twenty one that those were content agnostic, unless you were committing some kind of crime or something. Exactly. And yeah. you would just rent this space because you don't have a server farm, you don't have a bunch of warehouses in Northern Virginia with computers. In yeah, it. it's it's huge cost to, to an investment, right? To build cost, something like to that. to do that. So so everyone uses this. It's not literally a public utility, but it's effectively a utility, and everyone has access to it, and you just rent the space. Am I characterizing it correctly? Yeah. Until this point, you never saw like a cloud provider take action on someone's site based on content that didn't violate their policies. Now, right. you know, they would make the argument that they violated their policies, but in that case, they didn't give them a chance to remedy, and there's other providers like Twitter that violated their policies just as much, right. if not more, and, 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 and they, they didn't take didn't action. Violate the the legal code. They didn't violate the law. Yeah, like as far as I know, no, I don't. I don't know. Well, the they're never accused of that. Anyway. Yeah, exactly. Not they were a kitty porn ring or something like that, or they were absolutely yeah right. Um, so up until that point, had you ever considered that that could happen? No. So in the weird way that you know, because I've been in this space for for two decades now, I always did things the old-fashioned way: put it in our own servers, co-located, you know, rented rented servers, whatnot. We never participated in using cloud services uh, to any large degree. And this Why? was this was because I was trying to save costs. I didn't remember Rumble didn't get any investment until 2021. We were bootstrap built on our own with no our investment own hands. at all. None. It was just like our friends and 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 family. That's it. We built Rumble with our rolling up our sleeves and, and working our asses off. Uh, I remember in 2013, 2014 we got left out of the room when we asked for investment to compete against YouTube. Wow. So we kind of we had to do it the old fashioned way, save costs, really make thing make ends meet, and we did that. And you know, it just happened to be a really good choice. So it wasn't until you know after this situation with Parler that happened, we get a phone call from Peter Thiel, and Peter, you know, I. I I jump on a call with Peter, and he asks a, a pretty simple question. He's like, you Peter know, Thiel, if, for people who aren't aware, is one of, the, among other things, one of the most successful tech investors of all time. Correct. Yes, he started PayPal with uh, Elon Musk together. Yep. Um, so, 
he he asks, how are you hosting this? Like that being a very big, you know, weakness. That was one of his first questions. He, he, yeah, of course. How, how, are, how is this being hosted? How are like, are you guys using any cloud? And we're like, no, we're using bare metal, which means like we're, we're using servers and we're, bu- we're building on top of servers that we rent and lease and buy whatever. And he's like, can you scale that and own that yourself? And like, you know, this is post parlor. Like, yeah, that's what we need to do. We absolutely need investment to do that and build that out. And uh, he and we also feel that we can also offer this cloud services to to the rest of the market as well because people don't trust the the big tech companies anymore. There's a huge opportunity here to just be fair again and create a fair business in the cloud space where people can trust. And we think like the same phenomenon that happened with Rumble on the consumer side can happen on the cloud side. Uh, so and- you were in business for eight years. You never took investment. And you never used Amazon Web Services. So you were basically not controlled. Well, we used Amazon Web Services for small things, but we didn't use them for hosting our website. We used them for domain redirects. Right, we, right. We, it, we used them for very small things that were like so you didn't run your business off of AWS. Correct, correct. Uh, so it, you know, he, he, he ends up investing and then we end up stepping on the gas pedal and building out our own infrastructure, not just leasing things anymore. Now we're moving to a completely owned and operated uh, um, situation where you know we own all the hardware, we own all the ro- routers, we, we're owning everything now. The storage, the CDN, everything. We we want to we're creating all of it, and uh, you know we we we've been doing that for the last two years, and we're anticipating to launch it even publicly now to the rest of the world, where they can use it by the end of next year. So here's what I don't understand. <clears throat> I didn't know any of this till we had lunch two weeks ago, and. <laughs> This has been kind of the goal of everyone who's paying attention. If you believe in free speech and you think people have a constitutional and moral right, a human right to express what you really think, Mm -hmm. you need a venue to do that. And that venue is digital. And if you want to keep that open, it needs to be owned and operated. It needs to be protected. So everyone knew that we needed something like this. Yeah. You were building it, but with almost no publicity, or maybe I just never saw it, or... Yeah, well... Most of the world doesn't want to talk about it, I feel. It, at least it feels like that. Um, so our first customer that we put on in our cloud happened this year in April was Donald Trump's Truth Social. His entire social network is on our cloud, uh, meaning like no one can take it down, um, not any of the big tech companies. And uh, you know there was a little bit of publicity. Reuters covered it, but to no, no one's really kind of following it or... Or, or promoting it. In any, it seems in any like if way. you care about speech and about democracy, this is like a huge part of the answer. I mean, it's not a small thing. It's not just one guy starting a company. This is like, this is the path forward. So that's not a front page well, New York th- Times piece? I mean, I, I, well, they, they, they definitely don't want to talk about it. I remember that the, the one New York Times piece was an interview with Media Matters saying like they were super scared of Rumble because they're actually building something. It was like a little paragraph, which, you know, kind of was like a victory lap for us because it, it showed that we're actually doing something really meaningful. But, uh, you know, Media Matters was trying to do a hit piece, like talk talk about us negatively. And they were, they were it was basically saying that, uh, you know, Rumble's going to be a concern because no one, the activism that they typically do doesn't really work on a company like Rumble. <laughs> no. Because it doesn't. We're, we're immune to that. We're, we're, we're trying to be as mu- immune to cancel culture as you possibly can be. And but you're structurally immune. So that's yes, the difference. It's not that, just that you're tougher than the next guy. So or... there's two parts to the immunity for something for like, for Rumble. One is the infrastructure right. is not being able to get our legs cut out from underneath us. Yes. And the other is the advertising side, which we're also addressing by launching the Rumble Advertising Center. RAC is what, you, what we call it. So both in revenue and infrastructure, you're protected. Yes. Um, How in revenue? How do you do So that? we built our own demand. We built our own entirely own advertising platform that's in beta right now and uh, we're slowly moving off of all the exchanges and bringing in all our own demand and the great thing about rumble is that you know all the demand that we have right now is all direct response demand so like we have so many advertisers coming in and they're actually earning they're they're actually getting an roi on their investment on advertising on rumble uh because the, the audience that we have on Rumble is extremely valuable. And that's being discounted in the market. The, the, the audience that's on Rumble and that watch the content on Rumble, like the political audience, is extremely valuable. And anybody that says otherwise is completely wrong. And the activists like to say, oh, why? Why are, uh, 
why is GM advertising on Rumble? Why why is this X advertising advertising on Rumble? Well, you want to access half the country if you want them to buy your product, well, right? Well, of course. So, you know, launching our own advertising ecosystem provides a lot of immunity for that. And if well. you have a platform that people trust, they're much more likely to trust the advertisers. Exactly. Right. And that's why we're seeing high conversions when, when it comes to direct response. Um, a direct response ad for people who don't know this business is basically the advertiser, I don't know if this is how you do it, buys the airtime and then he gets paid when people buy the product. Correct. So it's very straightforward. Yes. And very easily measured. Yes. Whereas like when GM buys an ad, they're just trying to see how many eyeballs they get and they're not really following how many people buy the car. Like and there's no direct, real way to track. Way. Yeah. And I'm not criticizing traditional advertising, but, <laughs> but there's no way to really know what the effect of the ad is on the audience or whether even the audience sees the ad or not. But with a direct response, we know because you bought my product. Exactly. So you have, you're basically a digital prepper. You've like yeah. built this whole world that's invulnerable. Yeah, well, it's still building and there's lots of work to do, but yet we've got to a point now where we've been tested. How expensive? So one of the reasons no one's done this is it's. I mean, it it seems incredibly expensive to do something like this. Yeah, and it's nonstop in terms of capital investment and in storage. Think about it. Everyone's uploading the Rumble every day. Storage grows every day. It's more. We got to put more computers and hard drives in there to handle that storage. So right. So most people experience the internet as a virtual thing, and it's just so, unlimited. It's right. really not unlimited. You really got to put. You really got to put that server down. You got to lay it in there. Put the wires in. So Someone's got a physical do it. part of the internet is what you're saying. It's not yeah. just ones and zeros. You got to lift boxes. That's so interesting, and you got to pay for it. And yeah. No one wanted to do that. Correct. Yeah. So you went public. Yeah. So we went public in. Um, I would say September, was it September 15th or 16th of this year, we, we, we now trade under the ticker RUM on the NASDAQ. Uh, and uh, we, it was 2021 December where we announced that we were doing a SPAC merger with uh, Cantor Fitzgerald. And uh, I believe in this year, we're the most successful uh, SPAC merger uh, of the year with less than 1% redemptions. So... That, that rather than having you explain what a SPAC is and yeah, how, yeah. That, how that works, basically you offered up the company to the public markets you know, gradually, but ultimately, yeah. and they responded with great enthusiasm. Were you worried that they wouldn't? Uh, never worried that the market, I, I, we knew that our, our audience really believed in what we're doing. Uh, I wasn't worried on that respect. You know, you're always worried about the institutions and the competition and what they're going to do to try to make it a disaster for you. Uh, that, that's kind of where the worry was. And, you know, getting past that was a, was a huge milestone for us because I'm always thinking the system is going to do something to try to prevent it from happening. It took a really long time, lots of different questions. You know, I can tell you that there was, uh, we, we've dealt a lot of stuff with like France and stuff. Like we've dealt with a lot of issues uh, to try to take us out in that period, but we, we overcame them. I want to ask you about that in some detail in just a second, but I just just as a factual matter, so what did your valuation come in at? Uh, so we went public at uh, roughly a couple billion dollars. So our market cap right now is at a couple billion dollars. That's pretty amazing, considering you only started it nine years ago doing cat videos. What if you were to? And I'm I know that there are a million different, you know, ingredients that become a successful recipe, but. Um, what if you could isolate maybe one or two? Like, why did you succeed when so many others haven't? Just being fair and honest. That's all it took. Like at the end of the day, that was all we needed to do. But being really fair and really honest went a long way for us. Now, obviously, hard work and a million of of other things, of course, and, and like, being smart and seeing and, opportunities and, and doing the right things, etc. But the the real ingredient. For, for Rumble is just being very honest and sticking to our core our, our core principles and values since the day we started in 2013. You know, not moving the goalposts on our community um, and just being really tough, like taking in all these media hits constantly, taking in all the activist hits, always fighting back, uh, always, you know, being resilient and fearless. Uh, but the, I would say if I were to put it in, in two words, because I feel like None of these platforms are honest or fair anymore at all. 
I think you're right. And that creates a huge product differentiation for us. Amen. And it's, I mean, it's, it's such a virtue. And it's such a great thing for the world to see this. Um, and I meant to ask you this when we, we spoke a couple weeks ago, but um, you obviously have such a low-key temperament. But I, I watch what's going on at Twitter even right now. Mm -hmm. And we're learning that Twitter was basically, well, one of the things Twitter was, was an arm of the U.S. Intel community and foreign intel services too, where they used it as an intelligence gathering tool, yep. reading the DMs, and as a propaganda, which they were, without warrants, um, and as a propaganda outlet, obviously. So they know that there's a lot at stake. The world is at stake. Yeah. And information is the currency. Yeah. Like, let's stop lying. It's not oil, it's not gold, it's information. And now you control, you're the, I think you've got the plurality of share. I mean, you're the guy yeah. at this, multi-billion dollar company that allows the free flow of information. So like, how long can that last? And are you worried? At Twitter, they salted Twitter with Intel agents. There are 15 of them just on LinkedIn. You know, I work for NSA, now I work at Twitter. Like, why wouldn't that happen to you? Well, number one, the, the best part about Rumble is they all know our DNA. And I think they'd be scared to even approach us when it comes to doing things that are nefarious like that. Uh, Perfect example is is France. That that was that was the first moment where a government came to us and said, "Hey, we want you to remove this content off your platform. We don't like the information." It happened to be RT. Um, yeah, RT, the cable channel. Yes, the RT channel. The it was today. kicked out of the United States. Yeah, I, I think they're allowed. I don't know if they were kicked out of the U.S., but uh, they were kicked out of Europe for sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, the French government said, we're going to turn you off at the telco level. This means, uh, eight, you know, imagine AT&T and Verizon turning off Rumble at the telco level if you don't remove RT uh, because you're violating sanctions. First... Rumble has no operations in France. We're not a French company. We're an American company, to an extent Canadian as well. Um, but American, we're headquartered in, in the United States now. We have no employees in France, no operations. They have no jurisdictional reason to even come to us. But they said they're going to turn us off at the telco level. And obviously, you know, we're hosting uh, Truth Social. We're hosting uh, Tim Pool's website on our cloud. Um, if they were to turn us off at the telco level, there'd be a lot of collateral damage by turning those guys off too. Yeah. So we we made the decision to tell France to go pound sand, and so and we turned them off. Uh, do before do, do they, as a technical matter, a government has the ability to block your information within their borders? As a technical matter, you could technically achieve that with without a doubt. If you want to turn off, you know, a website, you can turn off a website. And uh, France didn't like, you know, it didn't violate, RT does not violate our policy. So we have our terms and conditions. You fall, you abide, you abide you're by our policy. You're making me want to watch RT very, very much. I don't watch <laughs> RT, but now you're making me want to watch it. Why, why is the government of France willing to shut down your website so that people can't watch RT? That what? is like the most concerning thing I've ever seen in my life is when a government comes and, to, and dictates to a person what they can or cannot see or cannot hear or, you know, cannot watch. Uh, that's frightening. Not because they're, that content is doing something illegal. But because they don't like the what they're they don't like the propaganda or they don't like what, the ideas, what they're saying yeah. or the ideas that they're saying, banning propaganda or grant banning ideas is abhorrent to me. And seeing that that's that's like a hallmark of like the 1940s. Let's you know, dictatorship, yeah. of course. Yeah, it's it's nowhere where this world should go ever. Everyone should have an option to go see what the other side is saying, whether you agree with them or disagree with them. That's right. And a government coming in and saying, "Not you can't do that," is not something I want to participate or be a part of. So what happened? We shut them off. We shut off France entirely. We, we you you would try to access Rumble in France, it'll say your government asks us to turn us off. Go talk to them. So now we are we're litigating against them to revert like to prevent them from being able to do that 
So do, using, I don't know how French law works exactly, but we have attorneys there that have now, we're file, we already filed suit against the French government for, you know, saying that they, they, they don't have the authority to be able to do this. Do you have any idea why it was so important to the French government that its citizens not be allowed to watch RT? <sighs> I wish I knew. Yeah. I have no idea. Again, it's quite a positive advertisement for RT, and I'm putting that on my list. <laughs> watch RT. Um, if Macron doesn't want me to, then I definitely should. Have you had problems with other governments? No. Not that I am that I can remember. I think, like, uh, China might might not allow our apps in, in their country. I think I remember seeing that a couple of years ago, but I don't know for certain about that. I can't remember, and I couldn't care to really check. But, you know... But, and but, I think this is like a greater problem. But France problem. in the same category as China now, is what you're saying. Yeah. 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 I, how, what's different in terms of censorship? Yeah. Like, that's totally inappropriate on every level. Every business should not want to work in France because they are doing things that we know through history are one of the worst things you could possibly do. D what's the coverage been like in the United States? That no one's touching us. They're not even reporting on it. Nope. This, I mean, am I? Uh, Fox News did report on it with Laura Ingram. One, one on that was the only time that I, I I've seen report. I feel like I'm on another planet. This seems like a very big story to me. <laughs> even if you're against it, it seems like a big story. Yeah, I think like it, it's uh, it's the first time that I think a a, a tech company has fought back against the government. Um, when it comes to speech, ever that, that I can think of, I don't. Nothing else. I can't recall anything else right now. Do you have good lawyers? I think so. Yeah. How stressful is this for you? Actually, I think our lawyers are amazing. But yeah. <laughs> good. Well, that's a great yeah. thing to think about your lawyers. So you you see these founders. I think Zuckerberg's really the only tech founder who's still running the company he started. Yeah, you still have like Sergey Brin and Larry Page that sit on the sort board of, of Google. Yeah, but so. they're not running it. I don't think day to day. Correct. And someone in a venture guy I know in Silicon Valley who invested a lot of these things once noted that to me and said, you know, that's because it's really hard because there's so many forces coming at you, not just not just business forces, but other forces. Like how But how, is it that hard? I don't just you that, tell me. You're the have, one who runs the all company. All you need is to have a backbone. That's it. Are are they all that weak that they all crumble? Yeah. Like, is that what's going on? Then we don't have good leaders at these companies. Like, it's not that hard to stand up for the right values. Free speech, like freedom of expression. This is part of the UN Charter of right, Human Rights. This is pretty easy. <laughs> That's such a good point. So you sleep pretty well? Yeah, I do. I, I, I sleep very well. I love that. <laughs> Boy, if you can keep that spirit, you will take over the world. No, I mean it. That, I don't know if I want to take no, no, over no, the world. No, but, but I mean in a good sense. You will yeah. liberate the world. I mean that that lightness and that clarity, if you can stay in that headspace, you will win. I'm completely convinced. It's when people become overwrought that they blow themselves up. So I Okay, so now I want to ask you about the content because you started your career, well, as a tech guy, but then as a, a finder, as a scout. Finding content, like what videos do I put on my site? Mm -hmm. And I know that you have an interest in that in a way that you do that. So what do you look for? In terms of like bringing content onto the yeah, platform? Yeah, if you want to, um, if you're, you know, you're running a young business, so you, mm -hmm. you want to pull in people both for the revenue, but also to make a statement and you look for people. How do you, how do you find people that you target? So, you know, obviously when the first wave of, content came in, which was politics, conservative politics. Yep. Uh, we, I, I was very interested in trying to bring on, you know, more diversity of, of content, like bringing on different thinkers and, yes. uh, you know, the free thinkers. And one of the, one of the very first people I approached was uh, Glenn Greenwald. Yes. Uh, to, to, and this was in like the summer of 2021. I, and we just re received financing from, from Peter Thiel. So we, we finally had some, some money to do do certain things and uh you know watching him do the snowden stuff like being one of the most free thinkers in the world that i've seen i approached him and i was like hey like i would love to have you on rumble and i i, I went uh, the my, my first choice was to go after to go glenn greenwald to bring him onto the platform 
Um, and now he just recently launched a show on Rumble. I know he did. Uh, last night was his first show, which uh, went went really well for for Rumble. So we love Glenn. Glenn, Glenn. I know. <laughs> yeah, we do for for the same reasons because he's just so, so principled. We yeah, and I, I was looking for someone that I followed, I knew, and like you know, someone that I thought would be a real good thinker and free thinker, and someone that has a real honest perspective on the world, at least the way I saw it. And he was the first person that came to my mind. I remember. The Snowden stuff, like it was yesterday, and he he changed my th- way of thinking on politics Me just too. because of the the reporting that he did. So we we wanted to diversify, and that we we brought on like uh, former Democratic uh, Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard and Glenn Greenwald at the same time in the t- middle of 2021, and then uh, post that we had Russell Brand join Rumble like on his own. And just two weeks after he joined, I realized he was on Rumble, and I didn't realize it was the real account. So, you know, that, that was pretty cool. Um, and then by 2022, we saw like more censorship happen. The Bitcoin conference in Miami got banned and taken off YouTube during the conference. What? Yeah. Uh, then we saw all these crypto. And... Wait, wait. I was at that conference. I didn't even know that happened. Yeah, it did. Why would they ban the Bitcoin conference? I have no idea. They have, they, they've, banned a lot of creators uh, for a lot of different reasons that we're never really privy to understanding. So they did that and then we saw a huge like influx of finance creators on Rumble and then uh, we took another leg of growth and we've been growing all year long. Uh, we posted the biggest uh, quarter ever was in Q3 of this year, 71 million monthly active users on average, 57 within Canada and US roughly. And uh, you know, going forward now, I really want to. I really want to get into like different categories, like music, gaming, and yes. sports. I think you know, sports and music are a real, real good categories for us to get into. Get into more of like the American culture, like yes. you know, not just politics. Like really start reaching uh, different um, different communities. We we saw huge growth because Andrew Tate joined. So that's, I wanted to ask for this. So I'd never heard of Andrew Tate before. I've come to really admire him without reservation um, as I've sorted through the many lies told about the guy. But I'd never heard of him and he was all of a sudden banned by everybody, kind of like what they did to Parler. They shut him down in one day. Yeah. I interviewed him just on principle, just, yeah. I don't know anything about this guy, but yeah. you should be allowed to say what you think, period. Yeah. yeah. And I want to play a clip for that because he, he mentions you, he mentions Rumble. In, oh, in our yeah. interview. Here's Andrew Tate. I'm just telling people what I've been through. It's really crazy. And uh, if they'll do it to me for saying women can't park a car, which was a joke, sorry world, then they'll do it to basically anybody. And you have to be prepared for that. And that's one of the reasons why I've moved to Rumble now, because I've had long conversations with senior management there, and they promised that I can make jokes without being destroyed and annihilated, which is quite refreshing. So I very much look forward to continuing my my uh, legacy and continuing my work on Rumble, uh, rumble.com slash Tate Speech. And I know for a fact that my young fans will come with me. So this is just the beginning of a max, mass exodus away from the influence of control by tech companies. This is the beginning of a mass exodus away from the influence of control of the big tech companies. When he said that, that kind of reframed how I thought about Rumble and um, and I was really excited by that. Did that happen? Did his fans come with him to Rumble? Absolutely. I've you know I would say we have one of the top two influencers on Rumble in the world, uh, Donald Trump and Andrew Tate. And Andrew Tate is enormous. He's bigger than everyone thinks, um, and the amount of people that he brought in with them or blew my expectations. So what, it, it, again, I'm 53, which is aged, like way past the median death age 100 years ago. So pretty darn old, okay? So he just flew right beneath my radar. Like I had no idea he even existed until this, all this stuff happened. And the amount of hostility aimed by the usual liars at Andrew Tate was just overwhelming. Like They hated Andrew Tate. You were required as a good person to join them in their hate of Andrew Tate. What was that? Why the attacks on Andrew Tate were were any of those attacks rooted in truth? Like you looked into this, didn't you? Yeah, we did um, deeply, and uh, it was it 
look to be the same tactics that are used against us, just throwing, throwing shit out there, taking pieces and clips and really taking them out of context. I remember when I first looked into him, I was like, oh shit, this is like, this guy's seriously bad. And then, you know, they made the case that he was seriously bad, like seriously a bad, bad person, like yeah. a criminal. Yeah. And, you know, once you start unraveling that and you're just like, wow, this is, this is very manipulative, like very manipulative. Um, and, uh, so yeah, it, after looking into it and realizing that, you know, most of this stuff is lies, at least the very bad stuff is definitely lies. Um, we, 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 he ended up coming onto Rumble at late August and, uh, it was like an influx of the Gen Z audience uh, that we saw like a massive increase on, and uh, they continue to come every single episode that he drops, uh, live stream that he does. They are there. He does on average now like his opening one was like a hundred thirty thousand, couple million people watched it in total, in totality, as his first episode, and he continues to do like couple million every every episode that he drops. Um, and when you're looking on the internet for live streams and you try to compare like how big Andrews are versus like the, the top guys on, on YouTube, this guy is one of the top on the internet. That, in the world. It, yeah, absolutely. In terms of influence and in terms of uh, following that he has. So, and that's measurable in a pretty clean and straightforward way. The yeah. number of people watching him live as he speaks. Yeah. So like the world's biggest gamer does like twenty to thirty thousand concurrent live streamers. Um, that's the world's biggest gamers, like Tim the Tatman, Doctor Disrespect. When Andrew Tate goes live, he does like on average like fifty to sixty thousand. So like double than the world's biggest gamers. Um, in the world, in the world, yeah. Now there's few that will will beat him, but like you know on, on YouTube, but they don't go on as often. And uh, but you're looking at probably one of the top influencers in the world within the young generation for sure because i didn't know who he was like right and you're way younger than i am and even you didn't know i had no idea who he was until like the summer i like he started popping up in the summer a little bit on our radar in terms of like influence he had youtube channel and he was showing up on a lot of the podcasts and and i don't have a tiktok so but he was immensely popular within the tiktok domain a very nice guy, actually. That's been my experience. A very nice guy. Yeah, but so do you just, this is a postscript and maybe not relevant to your business, but do you have any idea why it was so important for so many powerful people to eliminate Andrew Tate from the internet, which they tried to do? Well, I think the Twitter files are starting to give us like a look into that, into understanding why. They really wanted to control narrative. There was a lot of control around speech at these platforms, and they don't like his speech. That's it's as simple as that. The way I I see it, and uh, his speech was threatening, especially uh, the, with the people that he was communicating to. They didn't like it. So it's really that simple. If- it, they were banning him, and he didn't even have accounts on these platforms. Like they just were doing it out of like virtue signaling, like. Hey, we're gonna ban Andrew Tate from from Instagram, and he had an Instagram account, but he wasn't doing anything on Instagram that would be violating policy. Like, I can't imagine what they what what did they ban him for because of what they saw in the news. If you're gonna do that, there's a lot of people to ban. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is true. Um, right, we we wouldn't have an NBA if those were the rules, um, for example. But that was coordinated, like all of those. Very. Attacks on Tate came the same day. Yeah, just as with Parler, who's what's the mechanism of coordination? Do you have any idea? Uh, activists, like an assembly of a group of activists that all kind of assemble and go towards one cause. They use they create these groups on Reddit and, and on Twitter, where they kind of assemble themselves to take out targets and uh, put a lot of pressure. That's one way one mechanism that they use who pays for those groups you might know better on that than yeah, I, do. <laughs> I, might. Uh, I have some <laughs> suspicions uh reddit was you know 10 years ago a fairly open platform for yeah. speech 
well, the founder of Reddit, who's now passed away, was like one of the most vocal about free speech. I think his name was Aaron. I can't remember. It's it's been a while, but he passed away, and he I think his website is still up. Where like never let the internet ever gets like centralized in the sense of never you, you always have to keep it free and open i think the opening sentence that he has on his website is still up to this day the founder of reddit not alexis ohanian but the other founder that passed away is really speaks to this and it was in the dna of of a lot of these but creators reddit seems totally controlled at this point well yeah Condé nast owns them which i think you know tencent owns uh, uh tencent owns them a chinese company uh, I believe they're Chinese, uh, that owns a large portion of Reddit now, over 10%, I believe. So they are, by definition, not a free a free platform? No, definitely not, because we know of, and Breitbart reported this like a couple of years ago, that you can't even send Rumble links through direct messages. They pretend they're being sent to the other person, but they're not. Yeah. That's what Breitbart reported. I haven't tested it, but I would not be surprised. This is like a year and a half ago. Do you think um, Musk can really tell the truth about what's happened at Twitter? Can he? I would if I was there. Well, I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> so, yeah, he could. Absolutely. I don't think it's that hard. No, it's not. Well, it's not that hard. Um, do you think he will? Depends on his interests. If you... If, if he's really meaningful in wanting to expose it and that's what he cares about and he cares about free speech, then why not? What's there to lose? Like, in, in I don't know. Well, look what they What do, do you think? Well, I mean, you know, uh, whistleblowing, real whistleblowing, not fake whistleblowing, but like actual, you know, let's, let's stop lying now. That yeah, kind yeah. of whistleblowing. Yeah. You know, Julian Assange is facing the rest of his life behind bars. Oh, you mean, do you think that... There's a huge risk in doing it. Yeah. That's a good point. Ed Snowden lives in Russia, and I don't think he wants to. But he can't leave. Yeah. I mean, he's American. You know, he can't come home. Yeah, I don't think that could happen to Elon. Like, yep. he's too big of a profile, and he's based here. And But those are good points. Um. You have if, to be. You have to be fearless, I guess, like to do to do it. If if we were to really, you know, flip on the lights in the middle of the night, how many roaches do you think we'd catch on the floor of oh. Twitter and and Facebook and Google? I think you find a lot. Most of them are at Google. <laughs> if I were to take a guess, Google is like completely corrupt. Is my sense of it. I think they are the worst of the worst. I, I Twitter, I'm sh- like. You always knew, like none of this is like a shock to us. We right. always kind of knew what was going on, but I think there's something like when a company removes "Let's not be evil" or "Don't be evil" from their <laughs> slogans, like <laughs> you know, they they really control narrative. Think about this: like if you go and you talk to someone about something and you have a real intellectual conversation about them and they're smart, they're gonna go to Google and search it, and then. When they go to Google and search it and they only get like New York Times and CNN at the top of those listings and nothing else, they're going to think you're a nutcase because they're going to get a completely different perspective right. and Google is delivering that completely different perspective to people that you know we assume and we think and we know to be smart. And they're trying to be smart to try to like learn more about the situation that you just told them about. But you can't get to them because as soon as they try to even fact check and do reasonable thinking on their end, they get a narrative that is completely controlled to them. And false. Yes. That's that's the worst part about it is it's false. Like if you were to go and search about Rumble, you're going to get only New York Times perspective. Only like they're going to talk about one creator, which I've never even heard of on Rumble and make our whole platform to be about this one creator and call us far right. Uh, well, the beauty of talking for an hour is viewers can assess for themselves who you are. Yeah. Um, last question, and I hope that you will come back often. I think what you're doing is, is thrilling. And I think it, it's just amazing that something this important wouldn't be top of mind for every American because this really is the change a lot of people have been literally praying for. Um, 
But do you plan to stay with this? I mean, for real, because as noted, the founder tends to, you know, Jack Dorsey's not running Twitter anymore. Do, are you, are you in for a while? All the way. I'm all in. I could have been out a year ago, two years ago, and I made the decision that this is way too important. And seeing how weak everyone is out there only drives me to want to lead this even more because everyone, like we just discussed, like they're just, there's no backbone. No. And I think it's pretty easy. So if, if it's pretty easy for me, <laughs> I'll keep doing this. And uh, I'll, even if it's not easy, I'll, I'll take the tough times, the easy times, and I'll plow forward. I, I love, I love what, what I'm doing. And mo most importantly, I really believe in what I'm doing. I want to I wanna tilt the market back to something reasonable. And when everything is now reasonable again, and free speech is like recognized as a great thing, then I think at that point in time, I've done my job. But until that happens, like, I have a lot of work to do. Chris Pavlovsky, you have the most interesting and calmest affect uh, as you describe these things. I love it. Um, great to see you. Thank you for doing this. And Thank you so much, it. Tucker. It's been a pleasure. Appreciate it. Tucker Carlson, today's name of the show. Three episodes, brand new ones every week on Fox Nation. Of course, we'll see you relentlessly 8 p.m. on the Fox News Channel.